All right, everybody, come on in and take your seats and we'll get started here. All right. Thank you so much for being here at our HMSC Science on Tap. Um, this is a hybrid event, so we also have folks that are online um, as well as in the room. For those that are online, I hope you're someplace good with some good food and drink. Um, and if you have any technical issues, Roseanne is our technical support individual today. Thanks, Roseanne. Um, so you can put any of your technical questions into chat and she will make sure that we hear about them here in the room. For um, everybody in the room, because this is a hybrid event, we will be holding questions until the end of today's talk. And I ask that you raise your hand and I will bring you a mic or you go up to the mic stand up there in the corner and ask your question that way. That way it is um, able for folks online to be able to hear. For folks that are online, if you have any questions for today's presenter, just go ahead and put those into the chat and Roseanne will read those out to our presenter at the end of our talk. I wanted to do a couple of quick little announcements here. Um, I wanted to let folks know that our next Science on Tap in June will be our last one for the academic year. We'll take a little break over the summer. Um, and that will be Alyssa Conrad Rezado, who is with the Department of Land Conservation and Development. She's going to be talking about Oregon beaches and dunes and how much change they've gone through in the last hundred years and how the policies that are meant to protect um, and preserve those areas are now having to be used to deal with coastal hazards. So that should be a really interesting talk and that will be on June 20th. Um, if you're interested in any of our events, you can go to the HMSC website to go to the events page and everything you need to log into those is right there. Um, so I hope that you join us at our next Science on Tap. Um, but the reason that we're here for today, um, we are incredibly excited to have this year's Laverne Weber visiting scientist here with us. This fellowship honors uh, Dr. Laverne Weber, who was the director of HMSC from 1977 to 2002. The funds help us bring expert researchers to come and stay at HMSC and build the foundations for long-term collaboration with the HMSC community. Um, Lee Torres is actually the researcher who is hosting our Laverne Weber this year. So I'm going to actually hand this off to Lee, who sat really far up in the audience <laughs> um, to introduce tonight's speaker. So go ahead, Lee. All right. Thank you, Cinnamon. Okay. So I'm very excited to introduce to you all Dr. Andy Reid, who truly is a preeminent global leader in the field of marine mammal science and conservation. He um, is currently the Stephen, Ta Stephen Toth Distinguished Professor of Marine Biology at Duke University and the director of the Duke University Marine Lab in Beaufort, North Carolina, which is where I went to grad school and I was Andy's advisee for both my master's and my PhD. So go, do, go Blue Devils. Um, he, <laughs> and go Beeves. I'm conflicted sometimes. Um, so he's very highly respected for his work in conservation of marine vertebrates um, at the national and international level. So he's served on various committees for the IUCN, the International Whaling Commission, multiple federal marine mammal take reduction teams. He served as the president of the um, Society for Marine Mammalogy. And in, last year, in 2022, he was nominated by President Biden to serve as a commissioner of the U.S. Marine Mammal Commission which provides oversight for marine mammal policies and programs. So that's incredibly distinguished and we're very proud to have his wisdom here with us. Um, so he truly has been a longtime leader in studying and addressing the challenges of many marine mammal conservation issues, but particularly bycatch, um, including bycatch issues related to harbor porpoise, bottlenose dolphins, and as you'll hear today, um, North Atlantic right whales as well. He's also been highly involved in looking at disturbance to cetaceans caused by sound or other sources, um, particularly on sensitive um, species like beaked whales, which he'll be talking a little bit more about tomorrow at the science seminar. So come back for that if you're interested in beaked whales, which I know everybody is. Um, on a personal note, yeah, so Andy was my advisee, um, or advisor. <laughs> now, now I have many advisees, though. But he, he really is a brilliant um, ecologist and teacher and mentor. And really in my formative years, he shaped me in many ways and taught me how to think like an ecologist, how to fit my work into the larger field of both science and management and how to communicate my work effectively. So um, 
I, I, yeah, I owe a lot to him in many ways. But it, in science, we often talk about like our, um, our, our lineage, our scientific lineage. So who was our advisor or our advisor's advisee? Um, advisor. So um, it's really special for me to have Andy here today for him to meet my advisees and for them to get to know their grandpa advisor. <laughs> but I can only hope that I'm passing on much of his wisdom and legacy to my students because um, it's really is precious. So without without any further mumblings from me, I'll introduce Dr. Andy Reed. Is there a rocking chair I can sit in? Kind of tired already. Uh, thank you, Lee, for that lovely introduction. And thanks to the Weber family for their generosity in making my visit possible. Um, I've just been so enormously impressed by all the great science that's going on here, um, not just in Lee's lab, but, um, but, but throughout the institution. And I've learned a huge amount in two days. So it's been wonderful to be here. Um, I'm going to say just a couple things before I begin. One, uh, yes, I am a marine mammal commissioner, so I'm technically part of the Biden administration. Nothing I say today is to be taken in my role as marine mammal commissioner. I'm stepping outside that role so I can speak freely about what I think about right whale conservation. Um, so don't tell Joe Biden what I'm about to say. Um, and secondly, I hope that I'm gonna make this accessible. There's a huge amount of stuff going on on the East Coast with right whales. I'm sure many of you know much of the story. It's a very complicated story, and um, and I, I'm trying to make that accessible to, to a broad audience, and, and I'm going to try and make sure we leave lots of time for questions, because there's an enormous amount that we could talk about. Um, so yeah, so let's, let's, let's start. Let's go. Um, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to very briefly introduce you to North Atlantic right whales if you don't know the species, talk about their threats, what we're doing to address those threats. Talk about some of the political uh, events that have occurred recently that are, are influencing how we're able to conserve right whales. Uh, and then I'll give you a little sense of what I think is likely to happen. Um, and I'm going to, I'll tell you this at the outside, I'm going to be pretty positive and pretty optimistic about things. And I'll explain why at the end, but I, I still have hope for the species. They're in a very dire um, conservation status, but I, I do have hope and I think, I think we'll come through okay. And then just a couple of thoughts about that kind of wrap in some of my experiences from my visit here, which as I said, has been really wonderful. Okay, so this is the North Atlantic right whale, Eubelina glacialis, um, the first whale to be uh, commercially hunted. Uh, Melville talked about it as uh, a the most venerable of the whales. Um, they're enormous animals, 55 feet long, 60, 70 tons. They have these patterns of callosities on their uh, on their head that we can use to identify individuals. Uh, and there are three species of right whales, one in the North Atlantic, one in the North Pacific, and one in the Southern Hemisphere. And I'm just gonna be focusing on the North Atlantic species, but I'll come back and say one or two things about North Pacific right whales at the end. It's important to know how they make a living. They're filter feeders. They have very long plates of baleen in their mouths and they feed by swimming uh, through the water column with their mouths open, passively filtering out zooplankton, uh, little bugs in the ocean. And they have a particular affinity for one particular species of zooplankton, Calanistrum marchicus, um, very lipid rich. And where that species of zooplankton occurs, right whales will follow. Their feeding method turns out to be very important to their conservation because as they swim through the waters of the North Atlantic with their mouths open, they encounter fishing gear and often get that fishing gear entangled in their mouths which hampers their ability to feed uh, and as I'll show you can cause mortality and serious injury to them. We don't really know how many right whales existed in the North Atlantic before humans started to hunt them. Um, as I'll say in the next slide, hunting started in the 16th century, a long, long time ago. Our best guesses from models of habitat use and um, uh, suggest that there were thousands of whales and importantly, they were found on both sides of the Atlantic, the Northwestern Atlantic, where they still remain in a small remnant population, but also in the Northeastern Atlantic. And the Basque whalers, the Basque people who lived on the border between what is now France and Spain, started hunting whales in the Bay of Biscay back in the 1500s. 
And now we're left with a remnant population of just a few hundred individuals out of those thousands and thousands of individuals that were, um, were originally there. They were valuable. They were the right whale to hunt because they floated when they were dead. They had lots of blubber and whalers could render down that blubber to make oil, which had lots of uses. And their baleen plates were also very valuable. Pre-plastics, those baleen plates could be made into all kinds of useful things like buggy whips and corsets and things like that. And amazingly, when the Basque fishermen first came from Europe to North America to fish for cod, they noticed there were lots of whales around and the whales were the same whales that they had hunted on the eastern side of the Atlantic. And so their, their, their whaler cousins followed and as early as 15, the 1500s, whales were started to be harvested off the coast of Newfoundland and Labrador. The Basques kept very good records of the numbers of whales they killed, but they muddled up and mixed up bowhead whales and right whales. And so we still don't have a good idea of exactly how many right whales were killed, but there are places like Red Bay and Labrador where we can actually go and sample bones from, from the Basque harvest and look into, look into the past history of, of those populations. After the Basques decimated the population, there was Yankee whaling, and then when the population was really reduced to just probably a few thousand individuals, there was still shore-based whaling that occurred along the U.S. East Coast from New Jersey down to North Carolina, where I live. This is an engraving from a whale that was harvested uh, off the coast of North Carolina, very close to where I live. I can almost see the place where this whale was harvested. Um, and the last whale was harvested in 1916 off Cape Lookout, uh, which is, like I said, a stone's throw from my house. I have a personal interest in this because the land on which my house exists now was, is built on land that was owned once by a gentleman named Samuel Chadwick. Samuel Chadwick had the first license to hunt whales in North Carolina, royal fish. So he was able to, he was given the permit by the governor of North Carolina to harvest right whales and other royal fish as long as he provided a portion of the proceeds of that hunt back to the governor. Um, and Carter County, where I'm, where I live, our, the seal of the county actually has two right whales on it. It shows you the importance of that shore-based uh, whaling uh, activity to the, the development of the county. We're still looking for Samuel Chadwick's house. I'm gonna find it someday, the remains of it. And I'm like finding all those old cool whaling implements that are buried somewhere. When we think about right whales today, we think about them living in a very, maybe one of the most urbanized ocean environments in the world. Right whale females migrate south to the waters just off the coasts of Georgia and Florida to give birth to their calves. And then they have to run a gauntlet of all kinds of human activities as they make their way along the U.S. Eastern Seaboard up to New England and Eastern Canada. So a very great book uh, edited by uh, my good friend Scott Krauss and Roz Rowland describes them as the urban whale. And that's how we think of them. They live in this very urbanized environment and they are continually encountering human activities as they make their way up and down the seaboard, finding food, mating, and giving birth. We're also seeing now already the effects of climate change. We've seen very dramatic shifts in the distribution of whales on the feeding grounds. Most of the right whale population or a large proportion of the right whale population used to feed in the Bay of Fundy and Gulf of Maine. Now many of those whales have moved north to the Gulf of St. Lawrence in eastern Canada. So that means the conservation now has become very much a binational issue between Canada and the United States. Uh, and in 2017, for example, when large numbers of whales showed up in the Gulf of St. Lawrence for the first time, Canada was completely unprepared and we had a really significant mortality events, whales that were killed in fisheries and struck by ships there. So we're, we're already dealing with the effects of climate change when we're thinking about how we can conserve these animals population, every individual in the population is known, and we can identify those individuals based on those patterns of callosities, that roughened skin on the top of the head. So if you can get a good picture of the head of a right whale, we can identify who it is. Most of the animals in the population are genotyped. We have lineages going back generations of individuals, so we'll know who the grandparents or the parents of an individual um, in a population are. And we know also a lot about the history of body condition, the history of, of, uh, of reproductive events in these animals, who, who has fathered which calf, for example. 
This is an infographic produced by NOAA Fisheries, which is the management agency responsible for managing and conserving right whales in, uh, in the US. It's the Department of Fisheries and Oceans in Canada. And this just gives you a snapshot. It's a year or so out of date now, but it gives you a snapshot of what, what's happened recently in the population. Between 1990 and about 2010, the population was slowly increasing. Everybody felt pretty good about right whales. Individuals were being born into the population. There weren't too many deaths. Population was slowly growing, even though it was growing slower than populations in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, and then in 2010, things changed and the population started to decline. Um, this says that there were, in that time, at that time in 2020, about 368 whales left. We now think our best estimate is about 340. So the population has declined again since this infographic was made. And just on the right, you can see just where, where those losses come from. 50 animals known to have died or to have been seriously injured by human activities. The animals known dead, mostly vessel strikes, entanglements, the ones we can determine. Uh, a couple of perinatal mortalities, those are animals that died just soon after birth. Um, and then also animals that are seriously injured. The, the bars on the bottom shows you the number of, of calves that are born into the population each year. It's lower than what we would like. And in some years, for example, um, there are very few, if any, calves born. So that combination, too many whales dying, not enough whales being born, has led to the decline in the population size. This is another kind of more technical way, sorry about the hand there, <laughs> waving at you, um, a more technical way of looking at what's happened recently to the population. This is just showing the population growth rate. When it's above zero, the population is increasing. When it's below zero, the population is declining. And that dotted line that going across the graph shows you that delineation between population growth and population decline. So you can see that something in 2010 happened pretty significantly and the population has been declining since then pretty precipitously. And you can see 2017 was a terrible year when we had all those mortalities in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. So this is what gives us concern. We have a very small population, it's dwindling um, and it's dwindling pretty rapidly. In addition to the lethal effects, we know that there are important sublethal effects of human interactions like entanglement. And this, I'll just point to Josh Stewart's really beautiful work on showing that, that, that um, even sublethal entanglements can have important effects such as stunting animals' growth. Even if your mom was entangled in carrying gear, you're likely to be smaller than you should have been. And that stunting also has important effects on things like fecundity. Smaller moms give birth to fewer calves. We know condition is poor. We know that fecundity is low. But the analogy I like to use is, think of yourself as a trauma doctor in an emergency room, and you have a patient in front of you that's bleeding out. You know also that that patient has underlying health issues like diabetes and hypertension. Not worrying about those right now, you just try to stop the bleeding so you have a chance to do something later on. And that's where we are with right wells. We're not so concerned with those other longer term issues. We just need to stop the bleeding and we're not stopping the bleeding right now. You depressed yet? I'm gonna cheer you up at the end. So let's talk about the threats. The two major threats are entanglement uh, and, and ship strikes. This is a paper um, published by a whole bunch of friends of mine uh, a few years ago in which they took all the cases of uh, right whales that had been examined at death in which good postmortems had been conducted. And you can imagine that conducting a postmortem on a 55 foot whale on a beach is really difficult. And there are only really a few people on the East Coast who are trained to do that. People like Alex Costitas, Michael Moore, Bill McClellan. And they, they're extraordinarily skilled uh, pathologists and are able to be able to determine what caused the death of the whale. So of the 43 whales that they examined uh, between 2023 and 2003 and 2017, 22 died from entanglement, 16 died from vessel strikes, 55 died around the time of birth. And that means that if you were a right whale and you survived that perilous time around the time of birth, recently, you're not gonna die of natural causes. The only reason you're gonna die is because of human causes, which is a really remarkable thing to say, that essentially there's no natural mortality past perinatal mortality in this population because we're killing animals too quickly. And that's like a hor hor kind of a horrific finding, right? But it's true. 
We don't know how long right whales live for. There are some records of right whales going back a long time. Uh, we think that they might live 60, 70, 80, maybe longer. We know that bowheads can live for maybe 200 years. It wouldn't surprise me if right whales absent human mortality could live past 100, but we don't give them that chance these days. Also importantly, we know from some really beautiful work done by Richard Pace, who retired recently from NOAA Fisheries, that it's not just the animals we see dead on the beach that we need to count against the population. Many animals die at sea and are never observed. And he, Richard determined this by looking at the sighting histories of individuals and noting that some individuals have very good sighting histories and then disappear. And so they're not seen for 10, 12, 15 years, and we assume that they're dead. So that means that we need to take that unobserved mortality, what we refer to as cryptic mortality, into account when we're, when we're looking at how the population is doing. This is how NOAA, again, which is the re agency responsible for managing the species, um, thinks about managing and recovery. So as you look on the left, you've got this, the threats, vessel strikes and entanglements as the two primary ones. Potential and emerging threats. So there you can think about climate change, maybe the development of offshore energy. We'll talk about that, wind farms. Uh, and then if we can address those threats and reduce them, then hopefully the population will recover. We can monitor that progress. We can monitor the population as it recovers and then deal with new threats as they, as they come through. And overall, we can determine whether or not our conservation is being effective. So I like this as kind of a mental map of what we should be doing. So let's talk about the threats. Here's entanglement. So these animals, uh, the, they're built to feed intensively during the summer period and then fast for long periods of time. So a female right whale will feed all summer. She's pregnant. She will stop feeding in the fall in November. She'll migrate down to Florida and Georgia. She'll give birth to her calf, nurse her calf for months. And then in the springtime in April and May, she'll migrate back north. During that entire time, she's not feeding. She's drawing down on the energy she stored in her blubber, which is why the whalers loved right whales to begin with. Um, and that means that right whales can go for very long periods of time without feeding. So if they happen to get entangled in fishing gear, they can carry fishing gear with them for weeks or months, or sometimes even more than a year, even when they can't feed. Most entanglement occurs in gear like this, pot gear or trap gear. If you think about lobster pots or crab pots, often, we refer to them on the East Coast as being uh, fished in trawls, which are pots that are, that are strung together. Those vertical lines on the either side, of either end of the trawl are what whales typically get entangled in. Um, sometimes they can get entangled in the ground line between pots, but most of it, it's the vertical line. And because modern fishing line is so strong, often braided with steel in it, modern fishing gear is a much greater risk to right whales than fishing gear 20 or 30 years ago. So a right whale might get entangled in a pod of maybe even 10 or 12 lobster pots and then carry those lobster pots off. It's not like the fisherman goes out and finds a, lobster, finds a whale entangled in his lobster gear. The gear is just gone and the whale has taken them off. And I'll show you a video of what that, what that looks like in a minute. Rather remarkably, most of the population has scars of entanglement, more than 75%. And even more remarkably to me is that a quarter of the population accrues new scars each year. That means a quarter of the population is getting entangled each year. Um, and that's just a reflection of the intensity of fishing effort and the urbanization of the environment in which these animals live in. It's just, a, I think it's a remarkable statistic that animals get entangled that, that frequently. And those are the animals, remember, that are surviving. And <clears throat> I just wanna make a point, not from a conservation perspective, but from an animal welfare perspective. This is one of the most horrible things we do to any wild animal. This is a picture of a whale with line digging into the head of the animal. The animal's been carrying that line for a long time. And so Rachel Kassoff, who uh, wrote the paper I showed you on the previous slide, who's a veterinarian, uh, and Michael Moore, who I'll mention again a couple times in my talk, just make the point that this is one of the kind of worst cases of, of abuse of animals that we can think of. If this was your dog or your cat or somebody else's dog or cat, we would just never let this happen, right? But this happens with whales. They carry gear with them for months, sometimes more than a year, and they die a pretty horrible death. 
So that's entanglement. Ship strikes. This is a calf uh, born off the coast of Florida, uh, hit when it was just uh, about two or three months old and killed uh, and came up on the beach. And you can see the propeller marks there from the animal uh, as a result of the as a result of the ship strike. As I said, they're urban whales. On the left, you see a picture of the critical habitat that's designated under the uh, U.S. Endangered Species Act, and that critical habitat is designated to provide particular protection to vulnerable uh, life stages of these animals. But on the right, you can see the density of ships going in and out of ports in that critical habitat, the big one being Jacksonville, Florida, which is a big container port, uh, but also further to the north, Brunswick, uh, where there's a large Navy base with subs going in and out. So the moms come down to this area to give birth. The water is pretty, um, pretty calm. It's a good place to give birth, at least it was before humans urbanized it. Uh, but now those moms have to be careful that they and their calves don't get struck by ships coming in and out of those ports. And then we think about those emerging threats, that third circle that NIMPS considers in its, in, when it's thinking about how to manage and conserve these animals. Climate change, for sure, um, but also uh, more frequently we're hearing now concerns about uh, offshore wind, the development of offshore wind. Biden administration, for which I'm not speaking on behalf of today, I'll just say that again, has uh, pledged you know, 30 gigawatts of wind by 2030. So the development of offshore wind on the US East Coast is going very, very quickly, coming here too on the West Coast. And there's concern being raised whether the shipping, additional shipping associated with that development, whether the siting of turbines, whether the construction noise, or whether even the positioning of those turbines could influence the oceanographic features that are important for concentrating prey for these animals. So that's one of these emerging threats we wanna keep track of and, and think about, but it's not a threat despite what you might've heard in the media recently. Um, it's not something that we think of as a, as a current uh, important threat to these animals. I'm happy to talk about wind and whales. I do like five interviews a week about wind and whales on the East Coast. I did one yesterday in WYNC. It's crazy, and there's a, there's a whole interesting backstory to that. Happy to talk about that. This shows you the development, current development of offshore wind on the US East Coast. The uh, yellow uh, polygons are current uh, areas that are being developed. So they're lease areas that have been purchased by companies who are developing offshore wind installations in those places. There are two off North Carolina, there are a whole bunch in New England. And again, if you think about right whale females moving from the coast of Florida and Georgia up to their foraging grounds, they're gonna to have to navigate this gauntlet of development. The red areas are areas for future leases, including areas in deeper water, like you'll have here on the West Coast. Those will be floating wind uh, developments rather than the uh, anchored turbines that we are seeing in the yellow areas. So it's coming, we know it's coming, it's coming fast and we're gonna to have to deal with it. So how are we dealing now? We'll talk about that. And what are we proposing to turn around this population trajectory so that we get it back to a positive population growth? One of the things we do with entangled whales is to try and get the gear off them. We're part of the disentanglement network and everybody who's part of the disentanglement network at this point says, Disentanglement is not the solution to entanglement. We need to stop animals from becoming entangled in the first place. Disentanglement is risky for whales, very risky for humans, uh, and it's often ineffective. But when we can take gear off whales, we'll do it, just because it's gonna give that whale a chance to, to survive. And there's a whole bunch of specialized tools and techniques, and I'll show you a video of what it's like uh, to disentangle one of these whales. This January, uh, January 27th, sitting in my office, it was a Friday, but a phone call, aerial survey team, there's an aerial survey team in North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida in the wintertime flying, looking for right whales so that we can identify new babies that are born into the population, new calves. Our aerial survey team, you can see the aerial survey plane up there at the top, had found an entangled whale, a whale swimming, free swimming, but trailing gear uh, about 30 or 40 kilometers from the lab. Uh, so we mobilized, that's us uh, in the bottom left there, that's our rib, it's me in the bow. So we went out, found the whale, the airplane was circling over the whale. We were able to take pictures of it. 
you see the pictures on the right. Um, I don't know if you can tell from this picture, but the whale is basically covered with cyanides, whale lice. And that's an indication that the whale's in poor condition. The whale's body condition is not good. It's not terrible. The whale was swimming very strangely. It wasn't really moving its flukes. It was essentially sculling along with its, its pectoral flippers. So we were able at least to get pictures of the animal. We identified it because once we get pictures of the head like this, we know who it was. The animal was a male, adult male named Argo with a 42 year sighting history. So he was first seen as an adult 42 years ago. So he's an old guy. He's carrying gear, he's moving very slowly, he's swimming very strangely. So we go back uh, to our lab, and our lab is up here in Beaufort. This is Beaufort. This is Cape Fear, that's Cape Lookout. This is where the whale I showed you in the engraving, the last whale was hunted. This is where we saw the animal on the 27th, that's our boat track. And then we mobilize. Disentanglement of right whales is very complicated, it's very dangerous. All the agencies involved in this disentanglement effort are listed up there. Uh, and I'll say Georgia Department of uh, Natural Resources led the effort. Clay George, who worked with Georgia DNR until he just moved to NOAA, led the effort. He's a remarkable human being, um, but also with really important um, assistance from Florida Wildlife Commission. And then Clearwater Marine Aquarium Research Institute who were flying the aerial surveys. We had two planes flying over us, like taking turns. So there was always a plane over top of the whale. On the 28th, we went down and we attached a telemetry buoy to it. That means we know where the whale is and we got some underwater video I'll show you off so we could see what the disentang what, what was facing us in terms of the disentanglement task. And then on the 29th, we actually disentangled the whale. I hope this is gonna work. Yes. So this is uh, on the 27th, this is going out, finding the whale. There's the classic V-shaped blow of a right whale. And the point here is to grapple the line that the whale's trailing and then to attach a telemetry buoy with a satellite tag on it so that we can keep track of the whale once we, once we have to go back in that night. So we throw the grapple, let's see, wait, and then he gets actually into the gear. It was very difficult to see the gear. He gets into the gear, and once we're into the gear, then we can make the telemetry buoy fast. That's my mom. This is underwater video shot by Zach Swayman in my lab, showing you the flukes of the animal. So you can see the wraps around the animal and the two pots that the animal's trailing. This is the day of the, the disentanglement. This is the third day. This is what you should never do when you're trying to disentangle a whale to get up right in what was referred to, what we refer to as the kill zone right behind the flukes of the animal. And in 2017, Joe Howlett, who is a disentanglement uh, network member, was actually killed by a right whale in the Gulf of St. Lawrence trying to disentangle a right whale. And the right whale brought its flukes up and then came down and broke his neck. So we never want to be in this position, but because the whale was moving so slowly, because it was so badly entangled, we went in and the whale, you can see the way the animal actually raises its head up, basically let us come and disentangle it. But you'll see as we kind of work, and these are the Georgia DNI, DNR guys on the cutting tools who are working the gear, trying to get into where the whale is, where the rope is so tightly wrapped around and into the peduncle. Uh, and it's a, it's a challenge to actually get that off. It's a mess. And I don't have the video on because there's a lot of bad language. But you can kind of see the necrosis, right? So that all that kind of weird pink tissue is where the line is cut into the peduncle of the whale which is why the whale's not using its flukes to propel itself. We're hoping it's because it was too painful and the animal's like dragging these two really big lobster pots behind it. Um, not that the nerves and the muscles controlling the flukes were damaged, but we don't, we don't know. We were able to successfully disentangle the whale. You'll see I'm very cleverly standing back, not really pulling anything here. Zach, who's much younger, has a much better back. And this is the gear that the whale was dragging. There are two lobster pots from Nova Scotia, from near Halifax. So the whale, now swimming freely, still not using its flukes very much, had dragged those two lobster packs, pots all the way from Nova Scotia, probably sometime in November or December, down to North Carolina in January. So Argo's never been seen since. We don't know whether he's lived or not. He didn't show up on the beach. He was in not great body condition, so we're not sure whether he would have sunk if he had died. We're hoping that we'll see him sometime this summer or spring. 
but just gives you a sense of like a couple things like the intensity of the entanglement, the damage to the animal, the risk of the people, and that that's a crappy way to try and deal with entanglement. Right? We don't want to do that. So instead, the way we deal with entanglements is to put a bunch of folks together on a team, fishermen, folks from the NGO community, scientists, managers, to try and figure out smarter ways to keep whales from getting entangled in the first place. And these are referred to as take reduction teams. As Lee said, I've been a member of several of these take reduction teams and not a member of this one, thank goodness, because it's a really difficult one. Um, but uh, they've had the very difficult task of trying to figure out how to reduce or eliminate um, the number of whales entangled in each gear, in, in fishing gear. These are some of the ideas that they've come up with, putting weak links into ropes, so if a whale gets into gear, the rope will break. That's kind of antithetical to fishing, right? If you're a fisherman, you want your gear to be strong so that you're pulling pots, you're not, the, the gear's not gonna break. Um, other things like stringing pots together so there's only one vertical line, not two vertical lines, a whole bunch of other ideas. None of these have been very successful. There's a, an idea there in the middle called ropeless gear, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Last year, the uh, fisheries agency, NOAA Fisheries, asked the team to get mortality and serious injury down to less than one whale per year. And they, they did that basically, basically under court order because a judge had uh, decided that previous efforts were nowhere near, near, near um, sustainable enough. So we were basically under a court order to get the number of entanglements way down, which, um, would require a 90% reduction in the risk to whales, which is a huge series of modifications and changes to the way that lobster and crab pots are fished on the East Coast. And that was an additional like 50% almost to what the team had already agreed to. Very difficult. And that kind of process was going along. I'll talk about what happened politically in a second. But I think almost everybody in the conservation and science communities now believe that the only way that we can conserve right whales is if we move completely away from the use of typical vertical lines in a fishery and move to what's referred to as on-demand fishing or ropeless fishing. So on the left, you see how we typically fish pots, crab pots or lobster pots. There's a series of buoys with a vertical line going up, sorry, a series of pots with a vertical line going up to a buoy so a fisherman knows where her or his traps are. That vertical line is the risk and there are millions of those vertical lines in the water. So instead of having the vertical line sitting there the entire time the pot is fishing, what we could do is have the vertical line only come up when the fishing boat comes up and puts a, a signal into the water so that a float comes up taking the, taking the, the pot up with it. Um, there are lots of different ways to do this and I'm happy to talk about, um, talk about how those are done um, at, the end of the, at the end of the talk. This is expensive right now. It's technically challenging. There are problems with uh, setting pots in areas where there are other fisheries like trawl fisheries and gear conflicts. Um, but again, we just don't have any other solutions at the present time that are gonna allow fishermen to continue to fish and right well to continue to exist. And there's this whole process that we need to go through. Um, this is how we think about modifying gear to reduce entanglement risk. We've identified the problem. We know the bycatch is unsustainable. That's one and two. We have a design that's the ropeless gear, the Orangamad gear, that's three. Now we need to pilot it, test it, and then see if we can make it work in experimental fisheries. That's kind of where we are now. We're kind of like four, five, and six. And then eventually we need to get to eight, decision-making where that gear is required as a, as a federal regulation. We're a long way from that right now. So um, let's move, that's entanglement. Let's move to ship strikes. This is how we deal now with ship strikes on the e US East Coast. Um, in these colored areas, there's a mandatory 10 knot speed rule seasonally for periods of time when we expect right whales to be there for vessels that are 65 feet in length or longer. So if you're a large container vessel going in and out of Moorhead City, the port that's close to me from November 1st to April 30th, you have to slow down when you're about 12 miles from port to the speed of no more than 10 knots. And that's because a lot of modeling shows that if you're going slower than 10 knots, a right well will get out of the way if it hears you coming. If you're going faster than 10 knots, the right well has a, has a, has a uh, lower chance of, get, of avoiding a collision. 
And there are exemptions for certain categories of vessel, there are safety exemptions. And then there are these, what are referred to as dynamic management areas. And those are voluntary speed re restrictions when concentrations of right whales are identified outside those seasonal management areas. These still are not working. This is a right whale that was struck and killed by a vessel off Virginia Beach this last February. Presumably it was struck outside the seasonal management area, outside the 12 mile radius outside Chesapeake Bay, a 20 year old male. Um, so we know that the current measures are, are, are not effective enough. We need to do more. So what the fishery service is proposing is to increase the spatial extent of those areas, the seasonal management areas, and also to reduce the size of vessels to which that restriction is applied to, from 65 feet all the way down to 35 feet. And in, in addition, when right wells are, this is the, the proposed rule that the fishery service has put out, and we've had public comment and we're expecting a decision by the fishery service sometime before November. In addition to these, uh, these uh, new seasonal speed zones, um, and the dynamic speed zones in which concentrations of whales that are found outside those areas, the vessel speed rule would be mandatory, not voluntary. As you can imagine, this is being controversial. So let's talk a little bit about where we are with politics now. And again, I'm mindful of time. I wanna make sure we have lots of time for questions. A lot has happened. So just step back for a second. So the two major threats are entanglement and ship strikes. Fishery Service has asked the take reduction team to figure out ways to reduce the risk of entanglement by 90%. Scientific community and the conservation community say the only way we can do that is through ropeless fishing or on-demand fishing. We also need to reduce the risk of ship strikes. And what the Fishery Service has proposed is to basically blanket the East Coast seasonally with speed rules so that vessels, any vessel greater than 35 uh, feet in length would at some point in time, some point in the, in the annual cycle, be required to slow down to no more than 10 knots. So how has that gone over? Not so well. So uh, you may remember the omnibus bill that passed in December that funded the federal government, right? So Biden administration worked really hard to get a, a budget out and at the last second managed to get enough House and well, not enough uh, Senate Republicans uh, on board to pass the bill. Because the votes of Senator Collins and Senator King from Maine were so critical, um, those two senators, plus the rest of the Maine de uh, congressional delegation, were able to put a rider, sometimes known as the poison pill, on the omnibus bill that prevented any additional conservation measures to be placed on the lobster fishery in Maine and the other associated fisheries uh, for a period of six years. So that means the take reduction team is prevented from doing anything for a period of six years. Can't do anything to address entanglement for a six year period. I'm happy to talk more about that kind of political end run around the ESA and the MMPA because it's happening again right now with, the, um, uh, with current discussions in Congress about raising the debt limit. There are bills and provisions and bills that are gonna be, I think, environmentally very damaging and I'm happy to talk about that. So this basically puts a pause, it says, okay, we don't care take reduction team what you say, we're not, we don't have to do anything for another six years. Initially they asked for 10 and they were negotiated down to six. Huge fallout about the ship speed, the vessel speed re restrictions. This is from a North Carolina paper taken this week. Uh, in which there's enormous opposition. Governor, not the governors, the, sorry, the senators from Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, and North Carolina have all come out in opposition. Boat owners, charter boat fishermen, lots of folks have said, we can't do that, you, you'll put us out of business. So a lot of pushback here, especially from, from those kind of 35 to 65 foot um, vessel owners and operators. And then if you've been paying attention to the news, especially on the East Coast, all of a sudden people who never cared about whales care passionately about whales. Um, Marjorie Taylor Greene is like talking about whales uh, and talking about the fact that whales are coming up on, on the beach in places like New Jersey and New York because of wind energy. And so it's just like, this, you know, there's no scientific evidence, there's no links, there's nothing going on out there that would cause those whales to strand 
the number of whales stranding, and they're mostly humpbacks, not right whales, is not unusual. But just because that idea is being put out there, it's like it's out there. And so scientists like me spend a lot of time just pointing out that there's actually no evidence that that is the case, but it's, it's taking up political discourse. Okay, so this is when I'm gonna say, like I'm still optimistic and I am. And I'm optimistic because these animals in the system that they live in are resilient. Right whales have made it through the Basque whalers in Labrador and Newfoundland. They made it through Yankee whalers, they made it through the shore-based whaling in, in North Carolina. They've survived to this point and they're extraordinarily res resilient animals. Sometimes animals like Argo that we're sure are not gonna survive do survive because they're tough. And so I just believe, I really do believe that if we can just stop killing so many of them, that we will give them a chance and we will have right whales going forward. So how are we gonna do that? The good news that came with the rider on the omnibus bill is that an enormous amount of money was made available for the development of alternative fishing gear like ropeless gear or on-demand gear. This shows you the general appropriations for right whale conservation. It's a lot of money, right? I mean, even back 2010, 8 million a year to conserve and manage right whales. That's a lot of money for an endangered species in this country. But now that's up above 20. And in addition to that $20 million to do right whale conservation, there's an additional 26 million for the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission to think about ropeless fishing, $26 million. We don't even know how they're gonna spend that money. Um, but if you have a good idea, or you know an engineer, or you have a 13-year-old son or daughter who's got a really good idea how to do this stuff, you can make money now. But there is, so there's just an enormous amount of opportunity for innovation. And somehow we need to make that work and get those financial resources out to innovative people who can, uh, who can figure out how to get ropeless to work, or maybe there are other solutions out there. I think that ropeless is effective. We need to get the price point from where it is now, which is very expensive and not economical for many fishermen, down to the point where it is economical, where it's not an economic burden. And think about how we deal with some of those other issues like gear conflicts between pot gear and mobile gear. But I think we can do it. And the good news that is kind of the bad news is now that we have an additional six years to figure out how to do that, right? It was always gonna be hard. Now we have six years. Now what we really need is leadership from our politicians in places like Maine to say, yeah, you know, this is gonna be hard, but Maine lobstermen are some of the most innovative people we know and they can sort this out. And we need them to get behind that, not to say we are not gonna do this. And that's where we are right now, that they're still saying, we're not gonna do this. Right, wells don't get entangled in Maine lobster fisheries. It's not true. This is kind of the roadmap that NOAA Fisheries has laid out, which I agree with. So right now we're in the stage of figuring out new technology. We need to have very efficient systems. Then we need to figure out how a lobster or a crab fisherman can set her or his traps without getting them trawled up. So everybody who's fishing that area needs to know where their traps are. And there are clever ways that people are developing to do that. So as you're out there with your phone on board, uh, how do you know where your pots are? How do you know where Lee's pots are? And you have to do that outside cell service, right? Because often this is too far from shore. Then we need to have experimental fishing. One of the great things, we, one of the great mechanisms we have to encourage this is allowing fishermen to fish in areas that are traditionally being closed if they use experimental gear. Fishermen hate not to be able to, use, to, to fish in particular areas. So if you say you can fish in this area that has been closed to you for a long period of time, but only if you use ropeless gear, that's a really important incentive to get fishermen to say, I will want to do that. I will figure out how to do it. And then we need to work with the councils to figure out how to implement regulations. And we need to do that by 2028. It's a big ask, but fishermen are the most innovative people I know, and I think we can do it. Ship speed rule is gonna be really interesting to see what NOAA decides to do. Um, Janet Coit, the Assistant Administrator for Fisheries told us that they expect to have the rule, the final rule out before the next calving season and that starts in November. My guess is that they're gonna make some accommodations to minimize the effect on charter fishermen who are fishing with vessels 45 feet and under, but we'll see. And I think there are compromises there we can make, not necessarily in the spatial or temporal extent of these, of these vessel speed rules, but in the, the vessel and the size of the vessels that are impacted. 
This is the boat that hit and killed that calf that I showed you the picture of. And that's what happened to this vessel. It hit the calf at night, didn't know it was there. Boat sank, the $1.2 million vessel it sank because it hit the right well. So there's also a human safety aspect to this as well. And then we need to get out ahead of wind. I don't think, as I said, that the additional ship uh, traffic is gonna be an issue. We have a student right now working on that in North Carolina, a really smart student who's gonna look at how much additional vessel traffic there'll be. We think it's gonna be really not measurable because there's so much vessel traffic out there already. But this is an issue like, will these turbines, will a placement of those turbines actually affect the fine scale oceanography that's important to the feeding ecology of these areas, particularly in some areas where right wells are known to feed off New England. This is National Academies panel, it's been uh, given this, this task to tackle and they're, they're, they're on it. So I think we'll get out ahead of that too. And I really don't think that, uh, my sense is that wind is not gonna be an issue as we move forward, but, but we'll see. Okay, almost there. So just a couple of last thoughts. Again, I'm optimistic. I think we can do this. A um, couple of last thoughts that have come as I've been kind of contemplating and learning so much from, from being here. And again, I'm so appreciative of the opportunity to be here and learn from, from all of you. Um, this is a paper that came out from Lee's lab, it's a lens paper. It's an awesome paper. It's a great example of how we can use science to provide managers with information that are going to that will reduce the risk to whales. In this case, in the Dungeness crab fishery, and the question is, can we do the same kind of thing on the East Coast? It's harder because our population is so small, only 300 whales, and so the, we've done a lot of modeling, a lot of habitat modeling. But maybe there are things from here that we can, on the West Coast, from what you're doing, that we can take back to the East Coast, and hopefully be it, vice versa. This is going to be an issue for you guys, uh, and. It's not gonna go away. Um, and so I think, but this kind of science really helps us get out ahead of things. The other thing I wanna remind you all of too, you have right wells here, not very many. We, our best estimate that there are about 30 Eastern North Pacific right wells. I have a PhD student, Dana Wright, brilliant PhD student who just defended her uh, PhD last Friday on North Pacific right wells. Uh, it's a picture of animals about Kodiak. Um, we know some of those animals have scars from entanglement. Um, there's a lot of interest in what's going to happen to these animals with climate change, increased shipping going up through um, uh, into the into the Arctic. Um, there's been no effort really on the part, no no funding and no effort to really conserve these animals. Um, but we need to remember that they're they're out there. We have North Pacific right whales, and we shouldn't forget about them. Okay. I'll just end with this. If you're interested in right wells, here are two, two great resources. Michael Moore, uh, who's a great friend and colleague of mine who works at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, is one of those pathologists, those veterinary pathologists who conduct postmortems, wrote a great book called We're All Whalers. It's a great read. It talks about his history, but also his perspective on how everything we do, like buying stuff at Walmart, makes us culpable in some way because the ships that are bringing the stuff that you're buying at Walmart are coming through right well habitat. So we all need to think about how our personal decisions are affecting these things. And then there's a great documentary produced by um, folks in Canada called Last of the Right Wells. And it just uh, made its premiere on uh, PBS this month. And it's a great, it's, it's, it shows you what happened in the Gulf of St. Lawrence in 2017, 2018. And there's a, there's a passage in that video that shows you what happens to a right whale when it gets in gear. The, the video of the animal just after it gets into gear, it's the most frightening thing I've ever seen in my life. But it's a really good, it's a really good video. And I encourage you, if you're interested, to check out one of the two of these resources. And with that, I would be happy to take any questions. Optimism. <laughs> All right, I think we're gonna have some questions. So just a reminder, we'll take turns going back and forth between those folks that are online and folks in the room. So we'll start out, do we have any questions online? Which entanglement in boat striking policies would be most appropriate to implement to protect our gray whale population? I think Lee Torres should answer that question. Lee, do you want a mic? 
since she was my advisor, I think she should answer that question. I don't know enough. I really, I'm, I'm being serious because I don't know enough about the issues here. I think it would be uh, kind of foolhardy of, hardy of me to try and answer something, but Lee knows a lot, so. All right, we've got Lee to stand up. All right, um, this is unexpected. I guess one thing I'll say, is, which is interesting, um, and we were talking about this the other day, is that because entanglement is such a big issue for humpback whales, the ODFNW has implemented after May 1st that all Dungeness crab fishing effort has to be within 40 fathoms of the shore. So that pushes all that fishing gear right into gray whale habitat. So while they might, it's an interesting, you know, play between which species you're trying to protect and how that impacts another species. So we do see a lot of entanglement scars on gray whales. We also see a lot of small boat, mostly ship strike um, impacts on whales, a lot of propeller scars. Um, and we know that that is a, a key issue. The one thing I, um, I think there are small, really discrete areas that boats are most likely to hit a gray whale just because where the gray whales are feeding are pretty restricted. And so I think if we did like an educational campaign about where boats should go slowly, kind of what Andy was talking about with a 10 knot speed limit, like pretty much over reefs and kelps in the near shore area, our risk of hitting a gray whale with a boat would decline dramatically. All right, we're going to just kind of jump back and forth. So question in the room. Um, I guess kind of going back with like the boat strike and, you know, it's kind of being a big issue on the East Coast and, and things like that. Is there a tool for, let's say, I mean, that's a $1.2 million boat that yep. was sunk. Um, and I'm sure insurance was paying for that to, to replace that. But maybe some type of tool or a ruling that, you know, insurance won't cover. A whale strike. Um, people might think a little bit more about going full bore at night if they realize they're not going to get covered if they hit a whale and then sink their boat or destroy their props or or whatever. Yeah, that's a really interesting. And we think about you know market solutions all the time for things like entanglement and thinking about how to market seafood products. I haven't heard that idea before, but it's a really interesting one. Um, and I'm going to take it to some of my folks in the business school at Duke and who are thinking along the same lines about sea level rise and climate change and home ownership and insurance is what they tell me is that that's what will eventually drive change along the US East Coast when insurers say, we will no longer insure property for you. And when the federal flood insurance program collapses as it will do eventually. So I like the idea um, and I will, um, I'm gonna take that and run with it a little bit, thank you. This is why we collaborate. That's exactly. Awesome. All right. Question online. Are the other right whale populations out of the North Atlantic similarly threatened? Yeah. Good question. In the in the um, southern hemisphere, right whales, there are populations in uh, Brazil, Argentina, uh, Australia, South Africa. All those populations are doing much better than North Atlantic right whales. They're all well monitored. Animals are fatter. They reproduce more frequently. There are, have been some issues recently in Argentina, but in general, they're doing much better. North Pacific, we really don't know much about because there's been very little attention. The Western North Pacific population is larger than the Eastern North Pacific population. There are a couple of hundred animals there. We don't have any idea about trend. But in general, when we look at Southern right whales and we use, that as, we use them as kind of our benchmark, they're doing much, much better. They're increasing, their populations are growing very rapidly, or they have been growing very rapidly, as you would expect, largely in the absence of human, um, human caused mortality. If you think about those animals and the habitats that they inhabit, think about right whales in New Zealand or, or Australia migrating south into the Southern Ocean. They're just not facing the same gauntlet of human activities that right whales are in the North Atlantic. It's a great question. All right. I also recognize that we are at our seven o'clock. So if anybody needs to leave, feel free to either use the back doors. So you can kind of sneak out a little more quiet or you can just go out the front doors and we'll be fine. But I don't want to let Andy off the hook yet. So I'm going to do a couple more questions. All right. I saw hands. I'll just say before you ask your question, when I first stood up here and I saw you all coming in with drinks, I felt like it was one of those dreams. You know, I'm giving a presentation and everybody is drinking except for me. 
So thank you for being for staying with me and not falling asleep. I had a question on yeah. the example you had there on the entanglement with the uh, with the uh, whale was from Nova Scotia lobster yeah. pots. Do you have a lot of collaboration or coordination with Canadian fisheries as far as you know jointly trying to look at uh, you know reducing entanglement? Because it seems like you know if they're dragging them out of Canada right. to the U.S., then you know without Canadian yep. input, there's it's not really a solution. So. Really important question, and yes, so um, we know that those lot two lobster pots were from Nova Scotia because they had um, tags on them that identified them as from a particular lobster fishery area in Nova Scotia. So there's coordination between the United States and Canada. Canada has a different approach to endangered species, the Species at Risk Act, which is different than the Endangered Species Act. There is active coordination between Fisheries and Oceans Canada and NOAA Fisheries, and at the like the ministerial level, Ministry of Fisheries, Ministry of Fisheries and Oceans in Canada, and their counterparts in commerce in the US. But it's coordination. I would say it's not, it's not um, active collaboration. And for example, Maine fishermen point to that, to Argo, and say, let's see, it's the Canadians. And, um, and certainly a lot of it is entanglement in Canada. So there just needs to be better coordination, better, better collaboration, I think, between the two countries. And it gets fraught very quickly, right? Because those two countries are fishing for the same things and this cross-border, especially Canadian export of lobsters into the US, which Maine fishermen hate. Um, and so there's, Janet Coit told me that she goes to Canada to talk about right whales and about 10 minutes into the conversation, the right whales turns to lobster and that's all I talk about. Because um, it's where the money is, right? So, so it's a really good point. I think we can do better, but it's two different countries that are competitors, really, that are trying to work together. All right, question online. How is climate change affecting the distribution of the right whales feeding habitats? The Gulf of Maine is warming very, very rapidly where right whales used to feed in the summertime. I grew up working in the Bay of Fundy, working on harbor porpoises in the Bay of Fundy, and I started my career surrounded by right whales pretty much every day with the whale, the most common whale I would see. My, my dissertation advisor started a right whale, whale watching company, the first one in Eastern Canada, first whale watching company in Eastern Canada, and they saw right whales. There are no right whales in the Bay of Fundy anymore because it's warmed. There are sperm whales in the Bay of Fundy, which we never used to see, and the right whales have all gone north, and that's because the prey that they require are no longer there in the concentrations that they need. So the right whales have gone up into the Gulf of St. Lawrence and into, into that area where they feed. So it's kind of a Climate change has warmed and changed the productivity of, of the place they used to feed in, and the whales have responded by going finding another place where they can feed profitably. So that's how it's worked. Lisa has a very perceptive question for me. All right, I can hand you the, the hang on. Thanks so much for your talk, Andy, mm -hmm. or should I say scientific grandpa? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm curious about um, the sort of ship strike aspect. Is there enforcement of those um, speed limits and or how, I guess, far reaching a sort of public outreach to inform boaters about um, the speed limits within the 10 miles or 12 miles? There, there is enforcement. So NOAA uses AIS to track vessels and cite vessels. First of all, you get a warning, then you get cited. Um, Oceana, one of the NGOs who's pretty active in right whale conservation, did an analysis of AIS data in February of this year when that 20-year-old male was ship struck off Virginia Beach and showed that there's an enormous amount of non-compliance with it. And I'm guessing that all those vessel owners are getting notifications of fines, $7,500 for the first fine, $12,500 for every first incidence, $12,500 for every one after that. So it's happening. I think it's going to ramp up. Um, I talked to a Coast Guard officer who was on succumbent to, to a Senate office, and that's what he's going to do when he goes back to the Coast Guard. He's going to run that program to basically find people. So, Public outreach is an interesting question. I mean, if you're a mariner, vessel operator, it's your responsibility to understand what those rules are when you get out, go out on the water. So I think that's up. It's like saying, I didn't know I had to drive like no faster than 55 when I was coming here from Corvallis, right? It's your responsibility as a driver. Yeah. All right, we're gonna take a couple more questions. Question online. 
do fishing lines have, or could they have tags that can identify the owners? Yeah, it's been a big issue in New England. Fishing industry has dragged its feet, I would say, uh, in, in uh, gear markings. So often we get gear on a whale, we don't know where it comes from. The, the lobster pots we took off Argo, the, we had the pots, and so we could actually see the tags in the pots. Oftentimes the pots are lost and it's just the line and you can't tell. So that was one of the, one of the issues that was working through the take reduction team, marking gear. I talked to Lee about this here with the, with the uh, on the West Coast uh, entanglement issue. Marking gear is really critical so we know where gear is coming from. That right well that we disentangled off North Carolina, who would have thought that it would have dragged those two huge lobster pots all the way from Nova Scotia, right? I mean, if, if we, they hadn't been tagged, we would have never known where they came from. So that's a really important aspect of us understanding where the entanglements are occurring in the first place. All right, question in the room. These are great questions, thank you. Uh, I had a question about uh, certifications like whale whale safe, like what's going on with the market and from consumer side instead of relying on the political um, right. yeah, side of things. So you probably heard that Monterey Bay Aquarium took lobster off its like safe to eat list. And there was an enormous backlash from Senator Collins, Senator King, governor of Maine, threatening to like make sure that Monterey Bay Aquarium never got any federal funds ever again. Um, so that's kind of what you're dealing with. I think that that is a really powerful potential way forward. And one of the messages I'm going to have, so we're meeting in my role as commissioner that I'm not speaking in today. Two weeks from now, we'll be meeting with um, Senator Collins' staff. And one of the messages I'm going to give her is like, if you don't get out ahead of this, you're going to face a boycott on lobster. And that will be more punitive to the people you're representing than anything that will ever happen in a take reduction team. So those market forces can be really good. Think about dolphin safe tuna, think, go back into the 80s, think about swordfish campaigns that, that ocean NGOs put into place. So those are really important levers. They just haven't really been pulled fully yet. And lobsters, lobsters, not, you know, lobsters a, a luxury item. You know? So a lot of people I think would be happy to say, I'm only gonna eat lobster if you can demonstrate to me that it was caught in a pot that didn't threat, didn't pose a threat to a right well. So that's, I think that's really powerful. Great question. All right, question online. Oh, all right, question in the room. I really thought you were all gonna fall asleep in a glass of wine. Great talk, Andy. Thanks for the shout out. You are your highlight yeah. right there. He didn't ask me, had a meeting today. He did not ask uh, me to put that slide in. I'll just say <laughs> it was already in. Um, what's the price difference between the ropeless gear and the traditional gear? Like how far do we have to go to get yeah. to that kind of economic viability? I, I don't know the I don't know where we exactly where we are now, but it's right now I do know it's not economically feasible for most for most fishermen. It needs to be down more than an order of magnitude where it is now. But that's partially because there's no market for it, right? There are people who are developing this idea and testing it, but nobody's buying that stuff now because they don't have to. So we need to get that into the process where it's scaled up so we can manufacture enough of those so the price point comes down. It's kind of like a you know, chicken and egg, right? It's like catch-22. Um, I think right now it's, I can't remember, it's, it's hundreds of dollars per, per pot. Um, and so we need to get that down to like fifty dollars a pot or something like that. So it's just like buying a new pot or something. So yeah, we're a long way from that. Hang on just a second. This isn't a question. It's yeah. just we pay farmers to not farm. Yeah. Why don't we, as U.S. government or Canada, subsidize this to yeah. save a species from extinction? Yeah. Well, I think you know, that. So um, I got my start working on harbor porpoise bycatch, and the solution there was using pingers on gill nets. And fishermen didn't like that because they had to buy the pingers, which were at 30 bucks a piece. But eventually we got to the point where fisheries co-ops and NGOs were buying pingers for fishermen, saying, we'll, we'll buy them for you. Um, the other weird thing about these fisheries, especially the lobster fishery, it's a very inefficient fishery. And the, there have been several economic studies that have showed that if we reduce the amount of effort by half or by two thirds, would be more profitable. Lobster gear is set down there, lots of little 
small lobsters go into gear, into the traps, and then are, are released and habitat for them. But it's not a very efficient way of fishing. But trying to get fishermen to fish less gear is really hard. And they're very adverse. If you've met, if you, if you wander down a wharf in Maine um, and asked, like, would you not fish if we paid you not to fish, you'd probably get thrown off the wharf. So they're just, they're, that's what they want to do. All right. I know there's more questions for folks in the room, but I think we okay. have Andy hanging out with us for just a little bit longer, but I think we're going to wind up the formal presentation now. Um, so let's give our speaker one more round of applause. Thank you. I'm happy to hang out down here. If you have other questions, please come see me. Say that one more time. So I'm happy to hang out down here. So if you have other questions, please come down. Oh. And then if you are interested in hearing another presentation from Andy tomorrow, uh, we are putting him through the ringer here as he comes to visit us. Uh, we'll be doing our normal Thursday seminar and Andy will be our speaker at 3.30 in the same room. So please join us. Um, and remember, we have one more Science on Tap next month on June 20th. So I hope to see you there. Um, thank you again so much, Andy. I appreciate it. For folks online, we're going to wind up our presentation. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, and we'll get a recording of this online in a couple of days.